Welcome to Outside the Box TV. I'm Alex Ansary. It's July 19th, 2014. Tonight we're going to be looking at the hidden history of Portland, Oregon, a period of time specifically about 100 years before I was born, a history that is less hidden today than it was in the past. We look tonight at the known history of what desperate men and women did to other men and women for money in old Portland, Oregon. A very clear display of human cruelty brought on by circumstance and environmental factors combined by the unleashing of mankind's darker nature or inner beast. One we can still find today in the Rose City and to better understand our world, it's also important to understand ourselves and our history wherever it may lead, which is why we find ourselves looking at this particular piece of history tonight. The history of Shanghai and sailors and other transits out of Portland, Oregon, this region's original human trafficking epidemic. But first, the show times for this program happen to be Wednesdays on Channel 22, and that is at 10 p.m., Saturdays, Channel 23, that is at 6.30 p.m., and Sundays, Channel 11 at 5 p.m. The Channel 11 time is for the whole metropolitan area, 22 and 23 are Portland only. This program can also be found online at my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash alexansery, and will be soon posted to my website as well as my social media sites. So whether you know it or not, at one time this was one of the most dangerous places to go out drinking and palling around with strangers, especially if you are a traveling sailor or anyone else wandering around without their wits about them for reasons that we're going to get into. The history of the troubles of this region is significant when viewed from a perspective looking at the region's continuous issues with white slavery and other forms of institutionalized slavery and control. The truth remains in all cases, those that forget history are doomed to repeat it. Now, there's a couple articles that you're going to see that reflect some things that have been happening here in Portland. Tonight we're addressing the truth of what really went down in this dark town of the late 19th century. Not to demonize, attack, or condemn, but to educate. And people ask me often as I present this information about my hometown, why Portland? Why are you bringing up Portland? Portland is a microcosm for a larger world or universe. It's a great place to investigate the realities of a forgotten and often denied past, especially when the public image of Portland is another image of Portland entirely. Another reason is because I live here, and I am from here, and it just so happens that I've spent a great number of my years around the very locations where the events discussed tonight took place, and I have always sensed something wrong with our city's past, have found it fascinating, disturbing. In my body, I can feel that something is wrong, and I can feel that others subconsciously know that some trauma has been experienced here. I have seen what the city has done to others that have allowed themselves to be adversely affected in some detrimental ways, and I have noticed some very distinct patterns of history of painful lives and tormented souls that seem to be repeating some form of history. I feel a distinct energy signature and karmic connection between the past, present, and future generations. And I think there's more to know here and investigate than meets the eye. Long before I started the show in 2004, information already came to me through various sources on the underworld, the dark side of this city in the mid to last decades of the 20th century. While there is so much, or rather 21st century, and while there is so much focus on global politics and global conspiracies, over the years I have heard enough whisperings and murmurs over time as to how deep this town's corruption actually is. And it actually reminds me of a quote from Woodrow Wilson in the year 1913. Since I entered politics, I have chiefly had men's views confided to me privately. Some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacture are afraid of something, are afraid of somebody. They know that there's a power so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. Woodrow Wilson may have been talking about what he understood to be the Illuminati at that time. However, this very tone of caution expressed here is a tone I've seen others locally that know a few things about the real Portlandia, not just its past or recent past, but present day reality, under a system of control bending to the will of the financial interests that still rule Portland today, even parts of the underworld. And I've seen many take to watch before speaking above their breath and naming names of talking about what they really know about how deep the corruption actually goes. And this is for one simple reason. 
Many men guilty of wrongdoing are still alive in this town and have influenced today, and that is why the current knowledge of organized crime in Portland today is not widely known. Only snippets of the past involving deceased former members of office in organized crime are mentioned in the books published so far on the subject. Books like Portland Confidential, books like Dark Rose. We will get into this literature next week in greater detail. And we're going to get into what the public already knows about the city's participation, involvement, and so much more. But the end goal is to understand where we are today and what systems of corruption are in place today. In the week after that, we will examine what we know on the surface level concerning an ongoing serious sex trafficking epidemic in the Portland metropolitan area. A troubling extension of a shady unknown past, it seems to me. Despite the local media's exclusive cover-ups of lone wolf predators, it's wise to ponder, is there more to know in this story of why this problem seems to be getting worse and worse? And, you know, it, it, there's something strange about this town and why some of these things keep continuing. In light of what we know about our city's past involvement with the sex trade and so much more, why shouldn't we ask the larger, deeper questions? As if something is drawing those characters here or creating them here, we need to ask what those factors might be. It's also important that you know where Portland came from, just as it's important to know the history of our society, nation, your own ancestry, and so much more, especially if you're a new resident and you think that this is a family-oriented, safe place for your children. I would suggest you look closer. And also the social divides within society today and amongst people and families that for the most part live in isolation in increasingly non-compassionate and unnatural apartments throughout this sickened land we have found ourselves in. It's a beautiful land, the land of my birth, but it's not exactly natural the way that we are living. So let's not confuse this for paradise, a place of great sorrow and suffering from the rich to the poor, the east side of the west, from the north side of the town to the farthest southern points and beyond of the metropolitan area's edge. People are feeling that something is wrong. Let's all face the truth about this world and ourselves, no matter how troubling the truth may be to us. Like those that came before you, the New Englanders and the pioneers that came to this town in the mid-19th century, you are also about to find yourself in a place much, much different than the one described in the magazine, writing this as a number one city to move to. We need to work to continue to bring truth and awareness into our lives and use them as our guide and face reality as it is, not only for ourselves, but for others, specifically future generations that will inhabit this land at some point, which is a great land worth preserving and protecting. The entire history of this region is lengthy, and this program is short. So I will work to be brief. This is a 29-page report I'm holding in my hand, and uh, I have worked very hard to bring you this information. It's a fascinating story as to where we come from. And so I am going to cite what is known to have occurred in Portland, Oregon in the mid to late 19th century in what is now the Old Town Chinatown portion of downtown Portland. There are two books in which this information is drawn. I am citing from Mostly Wicked Portland by Finn J.D. Johns. One book that I read a year ago is that book, Wicked Portland, when I was off the grid in South Central Colorado. And you can find this book at the Multnomah County Library. There's several copies. There's also another book, and I just read that this week. I reviewed both this week. There's also another book here. It's a novel. It's called The Shanghai Tunnel. If I have time, I will read it, but I'm not interested in novels and fiction at this time. There's also a couple other books that have information about this history, and there's also a book list graphic that I put after this. For those watching online, you can freeze frame and get additional information. For now, I'm going to give you a brief breakdown and paint a picture of a, what a part of Portland looked like shortly after its inception. And so we begin. And in the beginning, at least here in Portland, the city history begins around 1843, getting its name in 1845 and becoming incorporated in 1851 at a time when it was America's second largest harbor on the West Coast. In 1851, the population was 800, 600 of them were men. In the city's first municipal building, a jail was built. In 1871, the population had jumped to 8,000, most of them men, transient laborers working on ships, mines, and in the forests. The city of Portland started as a clearing along the Willamette River, about halfway between Willamette Falls and the Columbia, established at what Sea Captain John Cooch famously announced was the farthest upstream point to which you can bring a deep water ship. 
It's more than one reason why it's called Portland. The population grew quickly in the mid-19th century, made up of mostly New England Yankee traders, pioneers fresh from the Oregon Trail, 49ers from the California Gold Rush who came north to settle down, Chinese laborers working at canneries and on railroads, Scandinavian and German immigrants working deep in the woods on logging crews, deep water mariners from Ireland and northern England, and Civil War vets from both sides. At that time, it was a city of so many possibilities for those with the means and capital to profit off the local resources and establish a industry, industry monopoly, and the first government for Portland that served the business elite. There were trees to cut and mill, gold and silver to mine, and grains to grow in the rich black soil and export to the world to the deep water port, as well as the fish the rivers, to fish the rivers and sea with a seemingly, at that time, endless supply of salmon. However, it was a very rough place, and in many ways a grossly unfair one too, a place where you can only really expect success if you were white, fluent and correctly accented English, and male. In the 1880s, Portland was no different from anywhere else in America in how it treated women. The initial seeds from which Portland sprouted were straight from New England. The town came within a coin's toss of being named Boston. Francis Petty Grove and Asia Lovejoy each wanted to name, wanted to name the place after their respective hometowns and Petty Grove won the toss, but neither of them actually wanted to name the town Charleston or St. Louis or Chicago. So eventually the town was named Portland, Maine, named after Portland, Maine. Portland was founded essentially a colony for New England. New England is famous for its practical, conservative, and hard-headed merchant class, and it's from that line that Portland's elite sprang. On a side note, worth mentioning, the first mental institution in Oregon sprouted during this time in 1961 by Dr. James C. Hawthorne, who came here from Pennsylvania. It was first located in downtown, and in 1962, the hospital was moved to Asylum Avenue, now called Hawthorne, around 12th Street. That's where the Burgervale and Tiny's Coffee Shop is today, next to the food carts, the location of a future micro-apartment complex. Also in 1867, the Arlington House was founded. This was the clubhouse of the original Portland elite. And that functioned as a club for the Portland business and political elite, also referred to as the New England Plutocracy. This club exists to this day. Their website is thearlingtonclub.com. And members of similar elite clubs throughout the country are welcome to come to Portland unannounced to stay in their suites. The town's Masonic history and involvement with the design of our road system is also very interesting and significant. The Yankee traders and merchant class from back east had no moral qualms with how business was conducted. And in fact, the Portland wealthy elite owned the properties in which many of the following stories took place. They had identified Portland as an ideal place to make a lot of money. And indeed, that's just what they did. The middle class was the Midwestern pioneers that came overland, not by sea, in covered wagons with families inside. Following the Oregon Trail from St. Louis, most of them had little money to spare. These folks simply sought a better life for their families in a place with clean air and plentiful land. Little did they know, most of the land was bought up. This group, along with the Yankee plutocrats, built the churches and used the resources, in some cases exploiting them, farmland, timberland, crops, and trade routes expanded. The transient class included sailors, miners, loggers, and other sons of wealthy families. On October 23, 1861, Henry Griffin found gold in China Creek in Eastern Oregon's Power River Valley. This brought a lot of miners to other parts of Oregon, in particular the north. That brought scores of gambling establishments and saloons uh, to Portland to make it a prime destination spot for hard-working loggers to blow their money after months spent working in dangerous primitive conditions in the woods until the job was done. But sailors had it far worse. Meanwhile, an ever-increasing number of deep water sailing ships from places like Liverpool started calling Portland home to carry that cargo off and across the sea. When they arrived, these ships were full of sailors who'd spent months on board, living in tiny bunks, eating horrible food, and suffering from months of boredom. So these sailors would ship ashore to join the party with several months' pay if they were lucky to have left the ship with anything, including their lives. There were also what was called the, the, the Sons of Scion, the... the, the the, the, the remnants men, these were the wealthy young men from more civilized places who had been sent to Portland because of its reputation as a sober frontier city full of hardworking, God-fearing pioneers. A pre-gold rush reputation Portland no longer deserved. These lusty lads would often get into far more trouble in Portland's north end than their parents ever dreamed of them getting back into back home. 
Many of these men were the scions of wealthy families who were being regularly paid what amounts to a black belt, blackmail payment in exchange for their agreement to stay far away from the family. In other words, these were the children of the elite that were living out lives in exile, supposedly in a clean city. Portland at the time of 1878 was an ideal place of exile, barely accessible by land, and getting there by sea involving a long, involved a very long and dicey journey. So the Yankee ruling establishment, also known as the New England Plutocrats or a Plutocracy, built two Portlands side by side. One side for the, quote, respectable permanent residents of Portland. And in 1866, that was only half the population. And on the other side, they helped create an interesting version of Sin City, old school Portland style. And by the way, Sin City, the graphic novels, Sin City, the movie, it came from Dark Horse, which is in Milwaukee, Oregon. So I'm sure there's a lot of inspiration drawn from the, the stories of Portland's old underworld that went into Sin City. And on the topic of graphic novels and Dark City, Dark Rose, rather, the book, uh, Paul Stanford, who wrote Portland Confidential, has also authored this book, City of Roses, and we may get into that next week. So there's a lot of inspiration that came out of this town. This town, of course, where the term Skid Row originates. And I'll tell you what, the story that we're talking about right now, it, it's totally fitting for a Hollywood movie. You know, uh, people get fascinated by the Titanic, people come into the, the, the brave new world, uh, the new world. It's a very romantic, it's a survival tale. And then you also have Gangs of New York. There's a lot of interesting characters in this particular cast that we're looking at here. So the initial plutocracy, they wanted two Portlands. And this other Sin City, um, they, it, it was supported by the money made through the crimping business. The, the, the uh, payoffs were taking place from the get-go. The local government was funded by Vice, and this continued through the 20th century. And the crimping business, which we'll get into shortly, I believe is one of the most immoral things to ever come to this part of the United States. Disrespectable, uh, dis disreputable Portland stayed stay tucked in the north end and occasionally spilled into the other areas of town of which a police force was initially created to contain the action and maintain what amounted to two separate Portlands. This arrangement worked beautifully well um, for many years before changes were forced into being by those calling for reform as serious problems began to develop. Physically, Portland in the late 1880s was a town in which the closer you got to the river, the sketchier things became. The early plutocrats resided in the Pearl District and later Knob Hill, while most of the action was taking place on the other side of the commercial district and the former Chinatown, which is located on 2nd Street in Old Town today. The area around 1st and Front was the center for the neighborhood of Waterfront Wharfs. The banks of the river were peppered here and there with sewage outfall pipes from which evil smelling and unhygienic substances discharged. And when the water levels were low, they glopped out onto exposed bits of river bank beneath wharfs and piers. The waterfront was nearly all privately owned and the general public had little access to the river and very few citizens had any legitimate reason to come down there other than to catch a ferry on Stark Street to East Portland. South of the Stark Street corridor was rough and to the north was even worse, populated by quite a cast of burly longshoremen, criminals, and other questionable characters. This was the neighborhood known as the North End, where most of this action fit for a movie takes place, in the area known today as Chinatown, present location, uh, Old Town, and a few streets beyond, specifically everything north of Stark Street and everything east of Park Avenue. That was the North End. This was a place of sailors' boarding houses, budget body houses, another name for a brothel, open gambling and cheap and plentiful intoxicants of every kind known to the 19th century. For most of a century, there was an unspoken agreement that as long as those businesses stayed in the North End and preyed on sailors and lumberjacks, leaving alone the rest of town, they wouldn't be bothered, at least not much. The raids were regular and predictable and were more a show than anything else. The payoff machine financed what later became known as the, quote, Portland machine, a term also used to define Portland's original corrupt political class that profited off of accepting bribes on actions deemed illegal and punishable, 
a unique form of social entrapment. So they create laws, they create jails. We live in a world now where there's prisons, but they're actually involved in the vice themselves. And we're going to see more examples of that in next week's show. In the mid-1870s, there was one licensed liquor outlet in Portland for every 40 men, women, and children in the city. hoo yeah! You can get anything in one of the saloons of Portland's edgier neighborhoods, including shot, stabbed, clobbered, swindled, stupefied with opium, knocked out with chlorophyll, infected with syphilis, poisoned with bad moonshine, or shanghaied. Yet Portland's reputation back east changed little since the 1950s when it was known as a sober, hard-working frontier town full of brave pioneers. This made Portland a virtual Venus flytrap for suckers from back east, and that includes people they were ripping off in their rigged gambling casinos. Vice became so rampant throughout the waterfront district that the area earned the names Court of Death and White Chapel, named after the parts of London stocked by Jack the Ripper. Variety theaters were soon born. The ancestor to today's strip clubs where actresses would perform a low-budget theatrical performance but da 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 then later come out and vamp the guests, persuading them to buy champagne and drinks with them. The ladies keeping their heads by pouring their drinks discreetly into containers they hid while their customers got more and more drunk and freer with their spending. These institutions caused a fair amount of notching of the teeth in the respectable parts of town, as noted here in the December 28, 1982 Portland Daily Telegram. To the editor, what revenue does the city derive from the so-called variety theaters? Do they pay anything extra for enticing men and boys into boxes? They're to be plied with vile liquor by a lot of brazen harlots called song and dance artists, and then robbed? How many heinous crimes can be traced directly to these variety theaters? How many unmentionable acts are done while well, their perpetrators are under the spell of passions awakened by scenes witnessed on the stage of these places in which scantily attired males and females participate? Signed, a parent. In 1889, a political cartoon from the West Shore magazine, I love this one, showed a typical scene in old Portland featuring a blind man, uh, a blind policeman, ignoring the transgressions around him, which included a illegal pharaoh game, um, solicitation of prostitution, wild brawls, and people high on opium falling all over themselves. The Opium Dens of China. Portland's Chinatown stretched along 2nd Avenue, centering on Alder Street. And as the 19th century wore on, it grew until it formed a sort of buffer between the commercial district and the waterfront. There were saloons in Chinatown also, along with Chinese lotteries, Fan Tan, and other uh, gambling games, prostitution, everything else. But in that district, the drug of choice was opium. In Chinatown lived a population of mostly bachelors who had come to Oregon to make money but hadn't earned enough to get home to China. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 prohibited all immigration of Chinese laborers, making it impossible for their wives to join their husbands. Violent backlash against the growing Chinese population drove many into hiding. By the 1890s, they had been hounded out of every other major town by armed mobs. So secrecy became a way of life, even though it terrified the community. There's actually lynchings in Seattle, and there's a historical story about the mayor of Portland at that time saying, no, you're not going to lynch the Chinese, just back off. So a lot of them were forced into secrecy. And this partially relates to the Shanghai Tunnels, but perhaps not completely. There may be more to that story. So there's a lot of paranoia and fear about the Chinese. Maybe some of it was based in fact, maybe some of it wasn't. They were concerned about the Tongs. What social ills would the Chinese and the Tongs bring to Portland or were believed to have brought? Several high-profile cases involving opium overdoses rocked the city. The city of Portland with Oregonian reports paint a gruesome picture of tongs and secret societies corrupting the youth, a charge that may have been a mix of fiction with some truth. Fugitives were also known to hide out in the opium dens. So gambling in Portland was a big deal because there was a lot of money. There's a lot of people that were spending their money that they were making after they mined their gold, after they logged the trees, and for the sailors, they were able to keep whatever money. Wow, that was just a miracle. So it was, like, it was like some weird old West Vegas. Um, and in the late 1880s Portland, most um, saloons that were not variety theaters were by definition gambling dens. And the saloon keepers who ran them were gamblers by trade. Pharaoh, and I apologize if I am not enunciating this correctly, Pharaoh or Faro, was the most popular gambling game of the 19th century, but it died out when gambling fell under stricter regulation. This happened because for the house, Pharaoh only made sense economically if you cheated. Because Pharaoh was played with a special dealing box, there were dozens of virtually undetectable ways to cheat. 
By 1890, every faro game and every um, saloon in the country was dirty, with few exceptions, those being square faro games being played privately amongst friends. There were also other games played as well. If a saloon keeper had a faro game going, it was likely that somebody was cheating somebody. Now, a, gay, uh, a guy by the name of Edward, and this is, another, this is another name that's a little difficult to enunciate, Chambreu is what we'll call him, ended up in Portland after being ran out of San Francisco by vigilant, vigilante mobs. A lot of these people that came here that got involved in the crimping business, they came running from other places where people were going to kill them. That's also a reoccurring part of this <laughs> very interesting story. Uh, and so he was ran out of San Francisco. This professional crooked gambler, an ex-con who escaped from prison in Vancouver in 1848, was a part of a circle of toughs who called themselves the Hounds in San Francisco. They were involved in a gun battle with Mexican miners at a time when parts of California were considered Mexican territory. When one of their own got shot, the Hounds responded by perpetrating a massacre on the Mexican and Chilean mining camps. Dozens were killed, vigilante groups sprang up in response, and he dressed up like a tramp and bribed friends to get out of town. After some time drifting through mining camps, he hooked up with a one-time fellow soldier in the Civil War named James Lapias. In, San, in Sacramento, where they fought off angry mobs together, how romantic, at his... Uh, saloon and they both were in Portland just several years later running bars but first he got in the restaurant business in Portland and it didn't work out too well for him he found out that the Portland diners would skip out on their check it happened to be such a big deal that he started to beat up he started to beat up the diners for not paying and they started getting fined for beating up the diners and so he went broke and then he decided he would change tactics and join the standardized way of running a north end business which included so much more than serving food. James Lapis would later become Portland City Marshal for several years and later served 14 years as its chief of police. Chambreo later wrote that any desperado who had the necessary abilities could also always be elected city marshal. He may very well have been thinking of Lapeus. In his memoir, Chambreo gives us some priceless descriptions of how those connections helped in one of his North End saloons the one he helped operate. Quote, among the first things I did when I took charge of this hellhole was to fix the policemen on my beat. Every candid man knows that there's a vast difference between a restaurant and one of those places. I was better protected by the police in the hellhole than I was at the restaurant. That's because money's made at the hellhole, not the restaurant. He went on to give a few pointers on how to manage an angry, freshly fleeced sucker, again referencing his friend and chief of police, Lapias, who he admitted would send a policeman to the victim, give him the runaround as to where the guilty cheating party had fled to. Apparently, the setups of these gambling dens were very well thought out. His autobiography ends with full details on how to cheat at pretty much every gambling game known to the 19th century. He then leaves advice for any reader thinking of becoming a professional cheat himself with the words, don't do it. He says, I will use every effort and every means of my power, and if I succeed in turning one young man from going that way, I will be thankful to God and consider myself more than compensated for my labor. Besides being very expert in all these techniques, you ought to be a number one fighter. This is because it's very necessary uh, many times to persuade your opponent that you are right and that the money is yours. In fact, it is claimed that you have to kill at least one man before you can be anybody. It seems like a little contradiction. Maybe he drank too much. Maybe he got hit upside the head too many times with a blackjack. To every 1,000 young men that start out to be a gambler, 999 will fail. That sounds about right. So now we look at the North in girls. Prostitution had been outlawed in 1871, but in the North End, this was more of a suggestion than anything more. In fact, although it put on a good show, Portland city government seemed to go out of its way to avoid effectively enforcing anti-prostitution laws. One of the reasons was liquor taxes, and the three city governments, Portland, East Portland, and Albina, had come to depend on money forked over by the sinners of Portland to pay for basic expenses. In 1880, Portland got one-third of its revenue from liquor taxes if the brothels got shut down, a significant percentage of this revenue would go away. The unwritten rule was anything goes as long as it doesn't leave the North End. The middle of the Willamette River was not the North End. 
And on a clear day, passengers on the Stark Street Ferry, the go-between between between Portland and East Portland, would have been able to see people frolicking on the barge. This now put the activities of one part of Portland, Portland's underbelly, underground culture, on full display. For those crossing the river, in 1882, the citizens of Portland were angry enough about the lack of police action that they started putting pressure on the city to do something. Now we're going to look at Liverpool Liz. She was no beauty, but she was a smart businesswoman at a time where it's not only unusual, but illegal for women to serve drinks in a bar. She owned one of the more successful bars in Portland, the Senate Saloon. There are many women that work for themselves. There are not a whole lot of stories about pimps in these stories, although the stories about where these women came from is very mysterious. There is no story, and that makes me wonder about a whole lot of things. Not everyone would agree that Lizardpool Liz was an honest saloon keeper. 1903, Joseph Gilmore of Oak Point, Washington, claimed that he had been drugged in the Senate saloon and robbed the $25, more than $600 in 2013. He demanded that the city license committee pull Liverpool Liz's liquor license. Liz laughed off the charges, laughed off the charges, claiming that Gilmore never had $25 at all at any point in his life. Her connection with Larry Sullivan, the crimp and political boss of the North End, protected her from any action by the city. We'll talk about this interesting character in just a bit. Nancy Bogg was a brothel operator in Portland, operating at this time on a boat on the Willamette, whose connections with the Portland police were such that she was tipped off about a raid in advance, in which quite a show was put on for the people of Portland. In a theatrical manner, she, she fought off the cops with a steam hose, which she just so happened to have all rigged up and ready to go. The police that broke off quickly and started pulling for their respective shores, again, provided a source of comedy worthy of remembering. We're glad this piece of history exists. Later, the anchor of her boat was cut by a mysterious person, and a adventurous story follows with Nancy making a deal of sorts with a rowboat captain in Albina and his crew to help her stop the boat from continuing up the Willamette and drifting off to sea. While the full details of the deal to rescue Nancy and her dames in distress is not fully known, we can all imagine what inspired after the after-rescue party. The rest is lost to history. The historians of early Portland don't talk much about the girls, and it seems none of the girls bothered or dared to write their own stories down for themselves. What we know about the working girls of early Portland is almost all first filtered through a few key sources, all of the men, people like Spider Johnson, the old waterfront character who filled journalist Stuart Johnson's ears with this and other folklore. Some of it true, maybe some of it rumor. A lot of people have been looking into some of this stuff for years, and they're trying to figure out what just did happen here. We do know that for a while, there was almost an entire block of cribs. Yeah, get ready for this. Little rooms just big enough for a bed, a wash basin, and a window, at which available girls would sit leaning on cushions, looking through the window at male passerbys around 3rd and Yamhill in the, quote, respectable parts of town. This caused more... Trouble with churches just blocks away. And the story is about to get really exciting. And one of the most high-profile unsolved murder mysteries of 1880s Portland involved, unfortunately, a woman by the name of Emma uh, Merlotten, who was hacked to death with a hatchet by an unknown assassin in 1885. The interesting part is yet to come. The 1880 census lists a total of 58 prostitutes in Portland. However, it also lists 247 seamstresses. Hmm. Yeah, that would be about one seamstress for every 85 men, women, and children in Portland. More than a few of those seamstresses were more than likely augmenting their income through other ways. While some arrests were made, few charges took place, and it was back to business as usual. In April 1874, Portland experienced what has been called the Temperance Riots, in which women, some of them married to abusive alcoholic husbands, sang church songs and took part in other public displays to convince the men to change their ways. And in this case, arrests were made on the part of the Portland police. Of the women who found their male counterparts, some of them preachers overplaying their hand and despite some of the wild public bras that ensued that included the throwing of chairs, it was soon back to business in the North End despite the radical demand for moral reform. Several women were charged formally with disturbing the peace with a member of the jury owning at least one of the salons, saloons, one of the drinking gun-slinging saloons in town, and five others owning businesses of other, quote, types. 
The ladies were sentenced to spend a night in jail or pay $5. Offers to pay their fines poured in immediately, but they insisted on doing the time themselves. And so the six crusaders were carted off the jail, accompanied by a huge crowd of well-wishers. Hordes of visitors marched in and out of the jail. And the joint rang with the sound of six determined voices belting out song after song. Finally, visiting hours ended and the ladies settled down for the night. And it couldn't have been but a half hour that Chief Lapeas stormed to the jail and ordered them to get the hell out. He just so happened to own his own successful bar in town, and he was involved in the arrests themselves. The ladies, assuming this was just another attempt to <coughs> cut them a break, hurried to reassure him that they were quite ready to stay the night like the judge said. The chief didn't even let them finish, saying, quote, I'm the boss here. You leave. So leave they did. These temperance riots took place elsewhere in America, many of them mobilizing first in churches and then spreading outward. A lengthy description of these events can be found online, and this is also known as the lost chapter that did not make it into the book Wicked Portland due to size restraints. Now, this is the meat in the last 20 minutes here of this story of the 19th century Shanghai in Portland, Oregon. The crimping game, not to be confused with the pimping game. By the end of the 1880s, the ports of Astoria and Portland gained reputations as the worst in the world in regard to violence and dishonesty in dealings with sailors and captains. This is the core of tonight's presentation, the true story of the men and women who shipped sailors. Sometime around 1897, complaints started pouring into the headquarters of shipping companies in Liverpool and Hamburg from the captains in charge of their ships. Something new was happening in the faraway American city of Portland, Oregon. Apparently, the local sailor's boarding house operators, known as crimps, has suddenly started playing dirty. Once a ship arrived in port there, the ships, the sailors rather, would all vanish, and the ship wouldn't be leaving the city until its captain had paid thousands of dollars to the owner of the boarding house in which they were staying. Crimps, by the way, comes from a Dutch word for a holding pen for fish. And I also read somewhere else that its root meaning is agent. This was the nefarious and complicated scam that blackened the name of Portland around the world and caused James Laidlaw, British Vice, Vice Consul to Portland, unending headaches. So it also cost him a lot of money. Though the skippers had always had to pay the blood money, bonuses to the crimps to get new members, they never before had to pay so much for so many men. It was costing the skippers a lot of money and some of them abused their sailors greatly. It seemed as if the entire city of Portland was in on the scam. Complaining to police did nothing. Delays in the port became expensive. While they tried to sort out their legal problems and crimps increased their fees. This was the real reason they rang the alarm on an international level. The conditions of the sailors or what happened to their lives were the least of their true concerns. They were getting cut out of their profits by the Portland crimp mafia, so to speak. That's the real issue here. Cripping involved opening a boarding house. You see, back then there were no homeless shelters. There were no soup kitchens. It was, we have a boarding house or you can stay out in the street and you can freeze to death. Good luck with that. And they would extend credits to sailors. Okay, go ahead, have some food. Yeah, ha have a bologna sandwich. <laughs> That'll be $15.95, sir, plus tip. You know, oh, hey, sit down on my bale of hay. That'll be $25 for one night, sir. But, but don't worry about it. We'll take it out of your pay that you haven't even earned yet. So sailors in Portland, literally, it, it was like it was not good luck at that particular point in time to wind up uh, a transient in Portland and, and getting duped onto getting onto these ships. So the crimps extended credit to sailors, unemployed loggers, and hobos and let them run up the tab until they couldn't pay except by going to sea as a deckhand on a sailing ship. Soon the time would come when the resident would have to either pay up or go to sea. And so they'd be forced to go to sea, even if they were knocked out, even if they were drugged. And the crimp or boarding house owner would then get paid out of a advance against the new salaries the new sailors pay. When a ship needed a man or two, and there wasn't one in the boarding house, Sometimes the crimps would take even more drastic measures, and that is where the Shanghai came in. It got so bad that the French embassy actually filed a formal complaint in 1901 saying French sailors were regularly being crimped there. Uh, many other complaints were filed as well. 
In Astoria, the scene was similar, but because Astoria wasn't the second largest city on the West Coast, it wasn't as widely noticed. And, and for a while, they weren't sure which city was going to be the big city. But eventually, it was clear that Portland was going to be the larger city. Crimps operated in several ways in 1880s, 1890s Portland and Astoria, two towns separated by only 113 miles. Most ran boarding houses at which rent was on credit, and when a captain needed a few able-bodied sailors, also known as ABS, as they called them, the crimp would simply clear the house out, collecting a fee of $30 to $100 a head from the captain and often delivering the men unconscious, wrapped in a canvas tarp. Many were drugged, and if there weren't enough sailors and laid-off loggers living in the boarding house, the crimp might try prowling the downtown watering holes, chatting customers up, and slipping knockout drops in their drinks. In other words, Shanghai, a practice that pretty much all the crimps engaged in, but none would ever admit to. To keep the boarding house full, they'd go out to meet incoming ships, climbing aboard them even before they reached the dock, passing out bottles, passing out cigars, using their charisma, and inviting the sailors to desert the ship and come stay in their place. This practice was initially welcomed by the skippers because they wouldn't have to pay the men their wages if they deserted, although by the 1890s, that was no longer the case. Crimps drummed up extra business by coaxing sailors to desert while they were in port. Sometimes when the cargo was unloaded and it was time to set sail, captains found themselves buying their old crew back. This is where the backlash came in and not until. On those occasions when a ship needed a crew and your boarding house was empty, the crimps would go out drinking. Meet their new friend at the bar and dope his drink. He'd wake up on ship with his name forged. Because this, this wasn't entirely legal. They forged their name on the ship's articles. We're talking about British Admiralty Law, Maritime Law, and often with a U.S. Marshal standing guard to make sure he didn't jump overboard and swim to shore before the ship got out to sea. Sadly, this made it legal through British Maritime Law. We're talking about legalized indentured servitude. Once a sailor signed on board a vessel for his voyage, it was illegal for him to leave the ship before the voyage's end. So much of this was fueled by a shortage of sailors caused by desertion in search of a better life for themselves than a form of indentured servitude. If they left or were coaxed off the ship before it docked after being smooth talked, they lost all their pay, making them dependent on the crimp to take care of them. Portland's notoriety reached a peak in the mid 1890s. There's a waterfront story from that time about a particular crimp named Joseph Bunko Kelly who is rumored to have delivered two dozen dead men to the captain of a British merchant ship. The men in his care got into a case of formaldehyde, mistaking it for whiskey. His horror turned quickly into a alleged act that one could call criminally in friggin' sane. Here's one that old J.P. Hawthorne forgot when building the state's first mental hospital and then Asylum Avenue, now Hawthorne Boulevard, by his own account. He shanghaied about 2,000 men and women during his 15-year career. Beginning in 1879, he's also known for setting a record for crimping by rounding up 50 men in only three hours. Kelly was never arrested for crimping because it was not illegal at that time. He was, however, arrested for murder in 1894. He was convicted in March 1895 and sent to OSP, the Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem, Oregon. He was released in 1908. Afterwards, he wrote a book entitled 13 Years in the Oregon Penitentiary about the conditions there. He was hoping he would reach readers who might be entertained by his stories. They didn't really care. He was considered a has-been. By the time he came out, a lot of people weren't even thinking about cripping anymore. He left on a trip to California and never returned. Another major player in the crimp game, gonna make that money, baby. Gonna make that crimp money, baby. Another major player in the crimp game was premier boarding house owner in Portland, Larry Sullivan. This was a popular Portland tough. The captain of a German ship wrote in 1900, it almost seems as though they hold the whole law and authorities in their hands. Sullivan himself said to the German consul, I am the law in Portland. Larry Sullivan was a popular Portland character who was far by far the most successful, the most popular 
the most charismatic, also one of the toughest, of Oregon's Shanghai artists, a clever con man with friends in high places who also happened to be an active and successful brawler. It was he who engineered Portland's reputation as the worst port on the world for a ship to visit around the turn of the century. He did this by forging the, sh the city's unruly collection of crimps into an exclusive business cartel and by establishing political connections that gave his cartel the local political cover they needed to shake those skippers down. Larry Sullivan came to Portland from St. Louis and spent some time prize fighting, winning in Astoria, but losing an epic 75 round brawl on the Washington side of the Columbia River before thousands of Northwest residents that came from all over to witness this clash of titans. During that match, Jack Dempsey was in his corner, who was also in town fighting during Portland's golden age of illegal prize fighting. Jack Dempsey died in 1895 in Portland. While Lindsay lost in the ring in Portland, he was never known to have lost a fight outside the ring. And like other crimps I'll mention later, he has a brutal and ruthless reputation and appetite for sheer violence and intimidation. There are so many stories about each of these individuals that you can find in Week in Portland, in Oregon Shanghires, or any of the other books that I mentioned. He joined forces with some friends from Astoria, the Grant family, brothers Peter, Alex, and Jack Grant, whose father had been a pioneering Sh Shanghaier there, and opened a sailor's boarding house in a big old warehouse deep in the North End. In the late 1800s, there were several of these in Portland, including Jim Turk's place and later mysterious Billy Smith's joint on the east side of the river. As a boarding master, Larry was successful, to almost, uh, was successful almost immediately because a lot of these people just came from somewhere else and they had in their mind, they're going to make big, big money tricking people into these schemes and duping people. So these guys came from out of the woodwork. They saw Portland as an open town and a town with a local corrupt political system uh, that would work with them on some level, on more levels than that which we probably know. What distinguished him from the rest was not so much his fighting ability as his political skill. Larry Sullivan is the one who figured out what a great political asset a sailor's boarding house is. Sailors in the house are welcome to vote, sometimes over and over and over again, and to go around from ballot box to ballot box and to do it all over again. You saw something like this in Gangs of New York. Again, this was happening here at the inception of Portland's political structure. The waterfront was full of transient guys with no local ties, who could vote as often as they liked without anyone ever being able to trace them. Larry soon was a part of state rep Jonathan Bourne Jr.'s smoothly rolling Free Silver Republic political machine, delivering bales of votes for Bourne and his friends at every election. Bourne was also a member of the three-man Portland Police Commission, which means this alliance gave Larry law enforcement cover. By about 1897, through his political connections, he had the support of pretty much the entire local law enforcement community. The harbor master, whom he jumped and beaten nearly senseless back in 1893, was now disinclined to give him trouble. Through his careful cultivation of the local district attorney, he had an even more vital ally there, and he had forced an alliance, sometimes a rocky alliance, but a working one with the other powerful crimps in Portland and Astoria enforcing the smaller and newer operators out of business with the spits. One of his allies was fellow crimp Jim Turk. While one would think that they would be in competition, there is little evidence of conflict or war between them. They were often seen together at the waterfront near a variety of scenes of crime. Jim Turk is another well-known character in this sordid plot. Jim Turk was a slumlord who lived in his own slum, a drunken brawler who got hauled into court for a battery dozens of times, an abusive husband, a shanghaier of sailors, a whorehouse operator, and a dishonest clothing salesman. Oh, and he was also the equivalent in 1880 dollars of a millionaire in money that was literally randomly dropped at his doorstep in Portland, which allowed the capital to purchase the buildings for his operations. Where that money really came from remains a mystery to historians, including where it went after he died. Jim Turk was born in England in 1832, and the Oregonian reported upon his death that he was a man of family. However, he was by the age of 16 in America and fighting the Mexican-American War. In 1866, Turk had gotten married to a woman named 
Catherine, who was at least his equal as a boozer and a brawler. There's so many stories about her. She would get drunk in Old Town, Chinatown, act like a, you know, a, 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 a demonically possessed witch. She, you know, assault other women, assault other men. Those spirits in Old Town have quite the effect on uh, the human biological system, that's for sure. The two of them had opened a boarding house in San Francisco. They had two children, both sons, Charles and Frank. Then a few years later, the Turk family quit San Francisco and moved to Oregon. Jim apparently ran a saloon in Pendleton for a while and then moved to Portland and opened Oregon's first ever sailor's boarding house there. Jim Turk and his sons were knee deep in the crimping business, although they never admitted to Shanghai. And they ran some other scams as well. On many other occasions, they sold sailors suits of marine clothing and secretly stole them back before the ship sailed. The customer was left ha having paid for clothing he didn't get and no way fixed the issue short of diving overboard and becoming a deserter, which one guy actually did. All these tricks were standard procedure in San Francisco's colorful coast waterfront in the 1860s. Turks simply imported them to Portland and ran the system here like a new McDonald's franchise. And we have another character here, which we'll go into briefly. Mysterious Billy Smith was a skinny kid from the remote wilds of Little River, Nova Scotia, Canada, who rose to be a welterweight champion of the world in 1892. His Wikipedia page has his impressive fighting record on display, yet there's little mention made of his lifestyle choices in Portland, a town where he came to follow in the footsteps of Lindsey Sullivan. Mysterious Billy Smith was a Portland celebrity for decades, and he came here at the height of his glory. And he's often called boxing's dirtiest fighter. At the height of his career, he gave it up in Portland to go into business with the White Brothers, operators of a Albina Sailors boarding house. So the White Eagle, the bar there in uh, right off Interstate where they found the tunnels, this is likely where Mysterious Billy was working out of. Billy thought that there was money to be made and threw his lot in with the White Brothers who ran a Sailors boarding house above the busy Albina grain docks. From then on, he was always in the papers or in the jailhouse for some other or another ruckus, fistfight, Shanghai, bootlegging, tax evasion, messy divorce, or being shot by his ex-wife's husband. A lot of drama with these folks. Not very happy lives. Money doesn't buy happiness. But after a while, Mysterious Billy settled down, got a middle-aged pop belly, ran horse races, and opened a beer tavern in Albina where the Portland Public Schools Administration Building now sits. He was buried in the Pioneer Cemetery at 82nd and Southeast Holgate, in 1937, living the longest of all the well-known Portland Shanghaiers. The sailors themselves didn't have much say in all this. No one seemed to have given much thought to whether all this crimping in Shanghai was an okay way to treat them. And there was something else you should know about sailors in the late 1800s. They were virtual slaves. Once you signed onto a ship, you were essentially a indentured servant. Just want to make sure that that part is clear, that this was institutionalized slavery that was taking place with the okay of the then government of Portland. It was like join the military. You became shadow property, like a belaying pin or a cast or the ship's cat. The captain and the officers had blanket license to beat you, imprison you, put you in irons, or put you on bread and water. If an overly enthusiastic beating resulted in you becoming crippled or dead, it was chalked up as an accident unless the action was really outrageous and there was no recourse if a captain did something deliberately negligent or cruel like short the crew on rations. In 1897, the U.S. Supreme Court actually ruled that the 13th Amendment effectively didn't apply to sailors when it was declared involuntary servitude unconstitutional ruling in essence that merchant sailors were not fit to be entrusted with the full rights of citizens. In testimony before Congress in 1911, Andrew Furseth, the president of the International Seamen's Union stated, Mr. Chairman, I will state that there is one port on the Pacific that has always been known as the greatest crimping den in America. I refer to the Port of Portland. The end of the crimping era would come not from the law, but from commerce. Labor-intensive ships were giving way to the more lightly staffed steamships, and it was no longer necessary to shark up a big lust of able-bodied sailors. By the early 1900s, crimping, while still being practiced, was a dying art, and by 1915, when the federal government finally did something about it, passing the relatively toothless Seamen's Act, the practice was mostly history anyways by that time. Enter the lore of the Shanghai Tunnels. Many of you have heard the rumors of the tunnels below Old Town Chinatown and other parts of downtown Portland. Today, there are regular tours of the notorious Shanghai Tunnels with all kinds of lore and urban myth that have even made their way into mainstream ghost hunting TV programs. 
mainstream TV. Ghost hunters have also called the Shanghai Tunnels the most haunted place on the West Coast. But according to author Barry Balak of the Oregon Shanghaiers, there's little evidence that these tunnels actually were used for Shanghai. Instead, he suggests that these tunnels were primarily used by the Chinese and Tongs, and it was a well-known dwelling place for opium dens and hiding fugitives. He also claimed the exit side of the tunnels leading out to the waterfront were prone to flooding from over half the year. And so he talks about all of this, and there's also a report from the Oregonian January 21st, 1921. That's the first mention of the Shanghai Tunnels in the Oregon press. Then it was mentioned again in the 30s as they discovered it, as they started to go through Chinatown and uh, move the people through there. Whatever the truth is to this day, it is shrouded in secrecy and mystery. And there has been no clear sign of accountability on the part of the city's part in creating this deep labyrinth of a network of tunnels that to this day still exists. And many portions of these tunnels have been closed off to the public. There are claims of artifacts dating between 1916 and 1930 that are shown in these tours, including stories of men being knocked out with blackjacks by bouncers on the take and knocked downstairs where their shoes were removed and men were allegedly forced to walk on glass. There's also allegations of underground jails being discovered underneath the bars of Old Town. Stories also get darker with urban legends of North End prostitutes catcalling men into dark corners and alleyways where they were la later grabbed and shanghaied. Whatever the truth is, Old Town, Chinatown today is haunted in more ways than one, regardless of the specific ways in which the crimes were committed. What we do know is that a time came to Portland when it was commonplace to intoxicate yourself to such a point to where it was truly dangerous to make the wrong associations that seemed to truly enjoy profiting off of the immoral business of Shanghai, whether it was legal at that time or not. We also know that the stories of Portland's first working girls is also shrouded with mystery, including where they came from and what they may have been told about Portland prior to getting here. Other questions naturally arise as to whether or not some of them were forced into the business of prostitution to pay for their ticket here. We also do not know what pressures they were under and how many men they served in a single night, nor how many other trauma was induced. What we do know is that the dark time was dominating at that time in Portland, Oregon. It dominated the Portland, Oregon landscape uh, to the point that early residents of this city were capable of doing the most inhumane things to other humans. And that's something that we need to learn from this. For profit, to survive a world built on money and perhaps for even revenge because it's something that happened to them. What we do know about abuse is the way it seems to recycle itself amongst people, including multiple generations. There is something to be said about a so-called civilization that is about to live with itself for the things that it has done. What men and women, women and men have done to their fellow human beings out of a desire to survive and a desire to extract revenge. This concludes tonight's presentation on the early Shanghai days of Portland, Oregon, USA. Next week, we will continue the career criminal saga of the city of Portland and steps towards institutionalized organized crime that rocked the Rose City between the early, early, early 20th century and the late 50s, a time in which the world watched on national TV as Robert Kennedy put on a show for the cameras, grilling the city of Portland on its role in overseeing vice in Portland, Oregon. It was called the McLeland hearings of 1956, and Portland was never the same since, and it then sought to align itself with a progressive, reformed image, not in response to criminality from DC, like current so-called progressives would like to see themselves, but in response to its own tainted image now shown before the world. That show is coming next week. I'm Alex Hansery. This has been Outside the Box TV. Edition 316. My website is alexansery.tv. You can also find me on Facebook, youtube.com slash alexansery. If you support this show, please visit alexansery.tv slash assist. Take care, good night, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.